praise the name of the Lord. So like I was saying, the, the, the video was kind of like an intro for the sermon, so I'm just going to jump right in. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. If you are awake, please praise the name of the Lord. My, <laughs> my, my wife is always awake. <laughs> Even at 4 a.m. in the morning, she's awake. Matthew 16 from verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The Bible tells us that Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? Who do they think I am? What are they saying about me? Now, it's interesting, right, that Jesus Christ said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So Jesus knew who he was. Amen? In calling himself the Son of Man, he wasn't, that, he wasn't questioning his own identity. He wasn't having an identity crisis. He wanted to know what they think about him. And the verse says that they replied, some people say you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say you are Elias. Other thing, others think you are Jeremiah. And a bunch of folks think you are one of the prophets. Now, what they didn't say were the negative things that people had been saying about Jesus. If they were being completely honest, they would have said, some say you are a blasphemer. Others say you are arrogant. Some say you are disobedient. You actually left the family carpentry business to fall apart. Some say you're a misfit. Some think you're a vagabond running around from city to city with a bunch of vagabonds. Some think you are the agent of Satan. These people all had an opinion about who Jesus was. Some of the opinions they had was based on a flawed interpretation of scripture. Some of it was based on how they understood or perceived the things that they saw Jesus doing. But Jesus was not satisfied with what the disciples initially said. So he asked them, who do you say that I am? And the only one who had an answer to that question was Peter. It was Peter who replied, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to what Peter said by confirming that it was God who had revealed this to Peter. Now, I want you to do something for me. I want you to turn to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and ask them, who do men say that I am? Wait for them to tell you. Now, ask them. So, basically, what you're saying is, what are people saying about me? And if they say, uh, <laughs> you know you've got a problem. Now ask them, who do you say that I am? One of the things that I've come to realize is that many times we look to people to define us. We look to people to tell us who we are. And I'm sure, as I say this, many of us would disagree. But the truth is we value ourselves or esteem ourselves based on the perception of other people. Sometimes it is our parents. And sometimes it's our peers. And in many ways, those perceptions, they shape us. Because we spend our lives trying to either be who people think we are or trying to change what people think about us. When we were children, we looked for value in our parents' eyes. The things they said about us actually defined us. It made us feel this is who we are. The reason why is because as children, we were not self-aware. 
So we look to what they said to define who we were. So if they were affectionate, if they described us in positive terms, we felt very positive about ourselves. If they told us how much they loved us, you know, how, how wonderful we are, how we're just the best thing that happened to them. We grew up feeling very positive. Amen? If they, uh, 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 if they described us negatively, if they spoke to us negatively, if they, if they said negative things about us, you are so lazy, you, 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 you're useless, you have no sense. What is wrong with you? Why do you behave like an idiot? <laughs> we start to define ourselves negatively. And that is one of the places where low self-esteem comes from. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24, the Bible says, Gracious words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. And many of us are wounded because we did not grow up with gracious words. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Many of us have not turned from the way we started. The question, the challenge is how did you start? Because the issues we have with how we see ourselves started long before many of us realized. And it wasn't, it wasn't just the things that they said. Their attitude to us many times impacted or sent us a message about what they thought of us. If they would never listen to you, it sent a message of your importance. If they dismissed you, it sent a message of your importance. Now, if they considered your opinions, if they asked you what you thought before they made decisions, it also sends a message about your importance. So if, if you were often dismissed, uh, uh, denigrated, berated, it was very hard to see yourself in any other light. But if you were often praised, and told how, how valuable, how precious you are. You grew up with a positive self-image. Unfortunately, what happened for so many of us is that we grew up in an environment that was short on praise and heavy on criticism. Right. Affection was very scarce. We got praise, but we got praise when we did well. When we did well in school, we got praise. When we achieved the goal, we got praise. When we attained to certain positions, we got praise. When you were elected class president, you got praise. When you were elected class, uh, the head of the, of the football team, you got praise. You know, I remember when I was in school uh, a long time ago. <laughs> all the students, all of us were ranked according to our grade. We had class ranks, amen? Now, these days, the class rank is confidential information, right? Only the student knows his or her class rank. And whoever it is, they choose to tell. And sometimes you have to guess. But many times the difference in, in position is a decimal point. Yeah? It's a decimal point these days. Now, in our days, the class rank was not confidential. It was published. It was put on a notice board at the entrance to the school. So everybody saw it. In the mornings, we used to have something called assembly, right? Where all the kids would line up. You lined up according to your position the last term. Amen? So, so we, we all knew. Everybody knew who came first. Yeah? Everybody knew who came first. And we all knew who came second and who came third and who came fourth. And we all knew who came last. But now, with my kids, right, it's a totally different scenario. Nobody knows who is first, who is 10th, who is in the top 10 percentile, 10 percent percentile. Nobody knows any of that. You can, you can just guess. Now, at the end of our semesters in those days, we all got a report card. And I think they still get a report card. I still get those things in the mail. In my days, they didn't put it in the mail. They gave it to you, Marissa. They gave it to you to go and give your parents. Let your parents see what, they have, what you've done with their money. So you, you take the report cards home, right? I know for many of us, this is an alien experience. 
You, you take the report cards home, and you get 90%, 95%, 98%, 97%. You, 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 you know, you're, you get a prize for being the most well-behaved. You get a prize for being the quickest learner, but you came seventh. You came seventh. Yeah? Nobody is going to commend you for all those prizes. Nobody is going to commend you for all your A's. What you are going to hear, the person that came first. <laughs> clearly, a lot of us have heard that. The person that came first. Does he have two heads? Why couldn't you come first? After chastising you for not being first in your class, then, but you were the best behaved student. That's okay. That's okay. You, you will get one, some, some kind of lukewarm, barely there, very low key. It's almost like they're praising you grudgingly. Because a lot of the parents thought the way to motivate a child was to incentivize the child through praise and affection. It wasn't given unconditionally. It was given based on performance. And there was this constant comparison to your siblings, to your, to your cousins, to your neighbors. Look, look at you, look at you. Your, 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 your contemporaries, your, your mates. Amen. Often in a very negative way. Very soon, we leave home gladly. <laughs> and we go to school. And in addition to our parents, we start looking for value and identity from our classmates and our peers. And you know how kids can be cruel. You know, the, the playground insults and taunts. The exclusion from groups and activities. The harsh judgments of, of sometimes poorly trained teachers. The, the rejection that many of us experience from our peers. Now, God help you if you somehow were different from everyone else. Maybe because of the color of your skin. Maybe because of your socioeconomic status. If you are different from everybody else, you're in trouble. Or if you didn't have what everyone else had. Maybe everybody in school had a particular superhero backpack. And you're the only one that came with a backpack without a superhero on it. Everybody wore certain shoes. I remember when my kids were growing up. My daughter came home one day and said she wanted to go buy stuff from Abercrombie and Fitch. Somewhat expensive. And my wife said, why? <laughs> what happened to Walmart <laughs> and Target? <laughs> and and, and so, I, so I said to my daughter, I said, all your classmates, where do they shop? Abercrombie and Fitch. My, mother, my wife said, are they equal? <laughs> That's what she said, are they equal? Since all fingers are not equal, you're not going to do what your classmates did. But I, I had a little bit of understanding then. So I snuck behind her and took them to Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, uh, some of us did very well in school. <laughs> like my wife. <laughs> so they got a lot of praise from their parents and their family. Some of us did well in sports, so we got a lot of accolades from our peers. Generally, if you were good at something, or you brought something tangible to the table, like if you had money when everyone else is broke, or, or you had a car when everyone else had to walk, you earned the respect and praise of your peers. I, you know, <laughs> I was telling the folks in the first service a story. When I was in college, we used to have this Parties, very exclusive parties. 
with guest lists, right? And you had to be a particular kind of person to be on the guest list. Yeah, it was very exclusive, these parties. And you would get a bouncer who would stand at the door. And his job was to make sure that anybody on the list would not enter the party. Yeah? So one year, well, actually, every year in my family, we, had, we, had a, we have a Christmas party. But this year, my father allowed us to own the Christmas party. Yeah? And we made so much noise about that party. Everybody on campus wanted to be at my Christmas party. It was just, unfortunately, that was the only thing happening that night. Somehow, in moving people to the party from the campus, because I live far from the campus, we had this convoy of cars that took the, the ladies and, you know, to the... <laughs> that, that shifted people to the party. Somehow, me, that was having the party, I got left behind. So I'm on campus, everybody has gone to my party, and I'm left behind with one of my friends. So my friend says to me, hey, there's this guy that has a car somewhere in another hostel. If we go to him and invite him to the party, he will take us to the party. Now, this is a guy that would never, never have been in my party. He was not in the right club. He was not in any club. <laughs> Didn't wear the right clothes. He was just a nobody, a nothing. But he had a car. So that day, he was somebody. <laughs> so my, my friend and I, we, go, we, go, we walk up to this guy. He's in another hostel. We walk there because there's no car. We walk up to this guy, and we say to this guy, hey, what are you doing tonight? You know what the guy says to me? He said, man, he's busy tonight. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Now, I know my party is the only party. So I'm wondering where is this riffraff going tonight? <laughs> I, I'm telling you how I was thinking then. I, I'm a changed man now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm wondering where this guy is going, right? So when I asked, where are you going? He said, man, he's going to Femi and Montero's party. <laughs> and he's going to be lit. And then he goes, where are you going? And I'm standing there looking at this guy. <laughs> he's going to my party. I don't know him. I drew up the guest list. His name is not there. And he doesn't know me. And this guy is bragging on how, you know, me and him are so tight. And, and I'm standing there like, <laughs> you know, my friend and I were looking at each other like, really? So we let him talk. And then the guy is like, ah, so who are you? I said, I am Femi Omotayo. <laughs> you know, the guy goes, ah, mommy, how now? <laughs> it, it was... It was not necessary for me to say anything else. He took us to the party. Can I be honest of what I did to him? It was very wicked. I made them keep him outside for an hour. And guess what? He stayed there. Do you know why he stayed there? He stayed there. First of all, his only relevance was that he had a car. That was the only thing that gave him value. And he stayed there. He suffered the humiliation of standing outside the gate after carrying me to the party. Because if you were not at that party, you were nobody. He needed to be seen with the cool kids. So he suffered the humiliation of being used and discarded so dismissively. I didn't talk to him again that night. Oh, what? I've changed. <laughs> While I needed him, yeah, he had my respect. When I no longer needed him, he was nothing. So we all very quickly realize that the affection or the praise or the respect is tied to what you have or what you bring to the table. So if you have, you guard it jealously. And if you don't have, you have to get it. You realize that people accept you because of what you have attained, not because of who you are. If I had a dollar for the number of times I have heard a single person say, one of the most important, if not the main criteria for me to decide whether a person is eligible or not, 
is that they must have a college degree. I can't marry somebody who doesn't have a college degree. A degree is not who a man is. It is something that he has attained. A PhD does not make you a good person. It does not make him better than the guy or the girl who doesn't have an, a high school diploma. Having a PhD does not make you a kind person. Doesn't make you a, a patient person. Doesn't make you a forgiving person. You know, the result of all these experiences for many people is that we conclude that our value to other people is dependent on what we have achieved, on what we have acquired, and what we have attained. Sometimes where we were born, and if we're not careful, we start to see ourselves through their eyes. We start to define ourselves by what we have acquired, by our cars, our houses, our clothes, our children, our spouses, by our, our qualifications, our titles at work, and, and sometimes even our titles at church. You know, when we have these things, we hold ourselves in high esteem. And when we don't have them, we struggle to attain them because for so many people we have met along the way, if we don't have these things, we are nothing. And what's worse, many of us start to believe those things. We start to believe who they say we are. Even though the Bible says to us clearly in Luke 12 and verse 15, it says, guard your, 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 your heart against every kind of greed. Life is not measured. God does not measure your life by how much you own. The people around us measure us by what we have achieved and what we have owned, what we own and what we have attained. Are you a manager? Are you a senior manager? Are you the vice president? Are you a senior vice president? Where do you park your car? Do you park your car in the special spot or do you park your car where everybody parks? Do you have covered parking or are you in the lot? If you don't have covered parking, your life is dedicated to getting covered parking. When you wake up, you are dreaming covered parking. Because that is where the value is. That is the sign that you are valuable. So we chase these things. We chase them because that is what defines us. We have accepted that definition that I am what I own. That I am what I, what, I, what I wear. That is why some of us, I, I saw a lady yesterday, she was wearing a Valentino belt. The logo was as big as this. <laughs> it was as big as this, literally. I, I, I saw that it was Valentino a mile away. <laughs> and the reason why she wore that belt was so that we would know that she can afford it, that she is doing well, that she has value, that she has arrived. Some of us, oh, Jesus. If you lose your job and you can't tell anybody, then maybe the answer to that question, who do men say that you are, is your job. You are your job. So if you don't have a job, you're nothing. So you hide it. Because in your mind, your value is attached to whether you have a job or not. If you are not married, if you are embarrassed, that you're not married, that you're not yet a missus. Maybe you have tied your identity to the title of missus. It's not as if you can marry yourself. But not being married is an embarrassment. There was a man in the Bible called Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan. His grandfather was King Saul. And Saul was the king over all of Israel. So his grandson was a prince. Amen? Amen. Everybody knew he was a prince. He, was, he, he received all the privileges of being a prince. The, the accolades, the respect, the, 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 the sense of uh, uh, value. He got all of that. And then one day... His, father, his grandfather is killed, his father dies, and David becomes the king. So Mephibosheth stops being a prince. 
he loses the, the, the title and he had to go live with one of his father's servants. Let's quickly read a conversation he had with David. Second Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. He says, don't be afraid. David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? He was now no longer a prince. So he saw himself as a dead dog because he was no longer a prince. His identity was tied to his title. And when he lost it in his own eyes, he became a dead dog. You know, this perception of himself was so dangerous, he almost missed the greatest opportunity of his life. You know, David was being gracious to him, not because of him, but because of the agreement that David had with his father, Jonathan. So David, because of covenant, was being gracious to Mephibosheth. But because Mephibosheth had such low self-esteem, because his identity was tied to his title, he was about to turn his back on grace. Many of us can't receive grace because of how we see ourselves. And that is the problem with our identity. It causes us to turn our back on grace. David was being gracious to this guy. He did not feel worthy. Why? How can a dead dog eat at the king's table? If David had not insisted, if David had not persisted, Mephibosheth would have remained where he was. You know, the world tried to define Jesus. And the world will try to define you. And the problem is when we accept that definition of us, that image that the world says is us, like in the movie Us, is trying very hard to become us. But that is not who we are. Amen. It looks like us, but it really isn't. We are not our cars. We are not the square footage of our homes. Amen. We are not the, 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 the label on our clothes. We're not the price tag of our toys. We are more than our possessions. God says your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. You are more than what you own. You are more than your title. Who do men say that you are? Who do you say that you are? And that is where many of us are stuck. We're trying to be who they say we are. So we're trying and struggling to get the car, to get the house. And that is why people will lie and cheat and steal and even kill. Because their very existence is tied to those things. And that is why we struggle in places like, like Africa. Because people just have to be number one. Because right from childhood, you are under constant pressure to be number one. So you must be number one in position. You must be number one in wealth. So if you steal a billion, and the person next to you steals one billion and one, guess what? You're going to steal one billion and two. The person that stole one billion and one, do they have two heads? And this is such, and we pride ourselves on our competitive spirit. But we don't realize that we're killing ourselves. Many of us are so stressed out running this rat race. And we don't know how to get off. You can reject the definition of the world. You can reject the idea that you are what you own that you are what you have attained. You know, one of the things that I love about the Western world is that a man can earn $36,000 a year and be happy. When it's time for vacation, he puts his family in an RV, 
and they head to the Grand Canyon. They don't buy a single thing other than food. They don't go to the mall. They don't buy designer clothes. They just go and look at nature. I love that in the Western world, somebody will say, this house has been in my family for 150 years. My great-grandfather lived in this house. I was born in this house. And it's a source of pride. A lot of us of African descent, God forbid <laughs> that you live in the same house that your great-grandfather lived in. That means that there's no progress. Do you know why? Because that house is our, that, that progress is what gives us value. But that guy who's earning $36,000 and is happy and content is because he has found out that value is not in what he owns. So guess what? When you go to him and tell him to pervert the course of justice by taking a bribe from you, he can turn it down. He can think about lofty ideas like the state of our nation, like the state of the roads. So everything works. You pay taxes and your taxes do what they're supposed to do. Because the guy who is collecting billions in taxes earns $50,000, but guess what? His value is not tied to the money. So he does his job. But the guy whose value is tied to money, he will steal. He will steal. How can he see all this money passing in front of him? <laughs> and not touch it. And that is the problem many of us struggle with. We're constantly trying to fit in to this image of the world. That is why God said, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're trying to conform. That fake us is trying to become the real us. And many of us have let it. But now it is time to get off the wheel. It is time to start to see ourselves the way God intends for us to be. Next week, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking like Peter about who God, about what God has told me or who God has told me that you are. Because I know for certain you are definitely not the square footage of your house. Amen. You're definitely not the label or the, the, the buckle on your belt. You're definitely not your marital status. You're not your marital status. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So people marry people they should not marry. Because I just need to be married. Unless I am married, I am not respected. I am not valued. And if somebody is disrespectful to you, your immediate interpretation is because I'm not married. <laughs> when you start to say that, you have attached your value. You've attached your value. You know, when I was on this rat race, if my wife, my wife used to earn three, four, five times what I earned. If she so much as says anything that I consider disrespectful, immediately I said, it's not your fault. It is because you are earning more than I do. Do you know why? Because my identity, my value was tied to my earnings. So because I'm not earning much, my interpretation was that was the basis of disrespect. Who do men say that you are? Who do you say that you are? Let us go ahead and pray. Father, we, we thank you and we bless you. Father, we give you praise. Almighty and ever-living God, we just, we just bless your name. We, we just praise you. 
for the grace that you extend to us. But Father, for the persistence of that grace, for the constancy of that grace, even when we turn our backs on the grace, you do not withdraw it. Father, we just bless your name. Father, we pray that this week you will grant us revelation. Revelation of who we truly are. Grant us understanding of who we truly are. Paul prayed that we will, we will, that God will give us insight into the depth, the breadth of all that we are in Christ Jesus. That is the prayer we pray this morning. Father, we thank you and we bless you. Almighty and ever living God, we just give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord.